Well, good morning. This has been an interesting message as, as Pastor Tim uh, uh, signed me the passage and uh, I started working through it. Uh, this week, uh, twice, my computer screen just went blank. Is it okay? And then uh, this morning, I usually preach and teach from uh, using my tablet. And uh, when I went to turn my tablet on a few minutes ago, it says, uh, it's everything's blank. So that's why we have paper. And uh, so no worries, the message is here. Uh, and so if I'm a little awkward with regards to the paper, you'll understand that's the reason why. Yes, um, it's, it is a privilege for me to be here and to, to share with you this morning just a little bit about my background or who I am. Um, I have a wonderful wife of 30 years by the name of Debbie. And if you've been up to uh, Save On Foods, uh, pharmacy. She's a pharmacist there, and you may have uh, been served by her. We have three boys, uh, all adults boys now. It's amazing. They're 18 to 26, and 18 months ago, we got a daughter-in-law, and we are just so thrilled to have her join our family, and uh, it's exciting. Um, for those of you who are parents that uh, have young kids, uh, let me just tell you that something that we've been learning, my wife and I have been learning, is you're always a parent. And this summer, we have been parenting our adult children. Never saw that coming, but it's been a privilege, and uh, we just love our boys. Uh, one of the big things that I get to do here in the city is to serve young leaders. Uh, I serve older leaders as well, but the young leaders, uh, just sharing with them, coaching them, mentoring them, and I have an organization called kingdombuilding.ca, and that's what I get to do. And, it, and the stories, each time uh, I meet with them, or often when I meet with them, I say, tell me a God story. Tell me what's happening. What is, how have you seen God at work? And uh, I just rejoice in the Lord and what he's been doing. He is actively involved in this city in amazing ways. But as uh, Pastor Tim said, uh, the message today, we're following along on don't skip the dishes, serve, life is found in giving it away. And as we go into God's word this morning, let's just stop and just invite him in to speak to us this morning. I actually don't want you to hear my voice. I actually want you to hear God speaking to you. So let's pray. Lord, we have had a, a great time of worshiping you because it's all about you. Lord, you're amazing. You're more than we could ever imagine. You've saved us. You've given us your Holy Spirit. And we just say thank you. Now, Lord, as we come to this time of looking into your word, as we look at Romans 12, verses 1 to 8, Lord, we're asking that you would speak to each one of us, including myself, Lord. We want to be hearers and doers. And so, Lord, those things that might distract us, we just ask that you would take them away. That we might focus on you and what you're saying to us. Not what Steve is saying or not what we've been thinking about all this week. Lord, what is it that you have for us? Speak to us, we ask. In the name of Jesus, amen. Whenever I'm working on a sermon, the first thing I like to do is put what my purpose statement is right out front so that I know uh, that I'm staying on, on track. And the purpose statement that I have for today is for us to know and joyfully step into our servant and discipleship role in God's kingdom. And then come to the Lord's table with a thankful heart. As I mentioned before, the text we'll be looking at in the Bible is Romans 12, verses 1 to 8. So if you have a Bible, you'll probably want to turn to it. And we'll be referring to a number of scriptural passages this morning. Are we ready to hear the word of the Lord? It starts off and it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. And so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is, in, is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to, is, sorry, if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Starting at the first verse, and the first word, it says, therefore. Paul is saying, based on the teaching and the facts, and the context of the previous 11 chapters, here's your action item. Let's take a quick look back at the end of chapter 11. I love this passage, which will help us to put chapter 12 in context. It says, starting in verse 33, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. So the argument has already been laid out there. God's almighty. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all wise. Secondly, his decisions are much more complex than we can ever try to understand. And we definitely can't give him advice. Thirdly, he has given us more than we could ever pay back. We've sung about that this morning, what he has done for us. He is the one who gives us all that we have, even our existence. He holds it all together. Our purpose in life is to glorify him. So based on this, Paul urges us or calls us to respond appropriately. Notice he doesn't command us, but he appeals to on the basis of love. And Philemon 8, 9, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 confirms this. He says, So although in Christ I am bold enough to order you to do what is proper, I pr prefer to appeal on the basis of love. So how does he say we should respond? By offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we need to commit to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, one who seeks to follow, obey, and please him. Ephesians 5 says, Live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Do you know what pleases the Lord? How do you please God? It's a good question, and it's something we can be looking at. And here's some, if, if you've got a pencil and paper, you might want to write this down. Here's some studies that you can do. Look at Hebrews 11, the whole chapter, the faith chapter. Noah and Abraham and Joseph and Moses and Rahab are mentioned in there. But in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. One of the ways of pleasing God is faith. 
You can look into that chapter even more. Or you can go to chapter 13 of Hebrews. And if verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. How we speak. Are we talking about Jesus? Do we share the stories of what God is doing with others? And when we're going through tough times, do we come to him and say, Lord, help, I need you. We just sang, I need you every hour. We need him, not just every hour. We need him every moment, every situation. Another story that I, I love is in First, King, First Kings 3, and it's Solomon. As Solomon... Uh, is given the throne, he realizes that he needs help. And so he prays to God, and I'm just going to read just a little bit of his prayer. He says in verse 9, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And then verse 10 it says, The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. Solomon didn't ask for riches or fame or power. He said, Lord, help me. Help me to lead your people. Other studies, if you want to look at it, and, and you can even just go and look these up of, how do I please God? What are the things that please God? You can go into the Psalms. Psalms are a great book. Psalm 19 says, My May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be pleasing. Is that our attitude? Is that what we want? That is what we need to be doing. Bottom line, how do you please God as a disciple or as a servant? Well, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In other words, don't do it for yourself. Do it for him. And then Paul ends that chapter, uh, verse 1, by saying, folks, this is your true and proper worship. This is what we need to do. Paul goes into the second verse. He says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, as a servant of Jesus Christ, it's not fitting to copy or imitate, fashion, follow, or be wrapped up in the peer pressure, atmosphere, the crowd, or the temporal things of the world. And I like what J.B. Phillips, an English Bible scholar, says when he's uh, saying this verse. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into the mold. And how easy is that if we're not careful? We listen to the news, and there's always a, a slant on the news. And we can take that in, and we can be upset, and, and we can hear others, what they say, and we can start to think that way. But we always need to come back and say, how does God see it? Not how does so-and-so see it, or how does the media present it? How is God seeing it? And you know, one of the things that I have found when I've read the news and listened to the news, and I do a check on this, the Lord says, you know the situation? Instead of getting upset about it, why don't you pray into it? And so now sometimes when I'm listening to the news or reading the news, it just leads me through as I'm praying. I just pray through those things. As his disciples and servants in his kingdom, we're not to allow the outward pressure of the world to influence things like pleasure, power, or status. But instead, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And Pastor Tim wrote this comment, and I'm not sure if it's his original or not, but he wrote and said, being a disciple of Jesus is countercultural. It's both outwardly and inwardly being transformed into all that God actually planned and desires you to be. 
We're to be disciples of Jesus. The world would say, no, you're your own person. Do your own thing. Live for yourself. Build wealth for yourself. What does that all look like? Is this a self-improvement program? No, it's not. You see, to be transformed, we need to, first of all, inwardly surrender to God. This doesn't mean we just give up and quit, but rather give over and saying to Jesus, saying to God, yes, Lord, change me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Second thing we can do, and we need to do, is reading, thinking, and meditating on the Word of God and asking Him to speak to us through it. You know, you think of Psalm 119. What do we know about Psalm 119? It's the longest chapter in the Bible. What does Psalm 119 talk about all the way through? The Word of God. Isn't that fitting? You know, even if it's just one verse a day that you meditate on, you don't need to read chapter after chapter after chapter. But just read. Take one verse and ask God to reveal to you what he wants you to know and, and change you. Uh, for a long time, what I used to do is I used to read through the book of Proverbs. And I would take one chapter of Proverbs a day and read through it. And you see, you can match that up with the day of the month. And so it's easy. If it's the 15th of November, well, it's actually the 3rd, isn't it? Let's take the third. November 3rd, then I would read Proverbs 3. So much in there. So we've got surrendering to God inwardly, reading his word, meditating on his word, and thirdly, intently listen to gifted Bible teachers, like your pastor Tim. You know, when pastor Tim prepares a message, he actually doesn't prepare the message so that you'll come here and you'll hear him go, wow, that was a good message. Pastor Tim did a good job of putting that together. I like the stories he told. I like that. No, actually, Pastor Tim, when he prepares a message, he really wants God to speak through him to you so that you'll be transformed. And so it's important to listen to godly, gifted Bible teachers like Pastor Tim. Fourthly, I want to encourage you to be actively involved in a Christian community and allow others to speak into your life. And you can speak into their life as well as the Holy Spirit leads you. In other words, hang out with other disciples of Jesus Christ. That helps us be transformed. And lastly, I would put before you is worshiping and focusing on God. You know, we came together and we sang songs of worship to God. That helps transform our minds. And in fact, one of the beautiful things that we do is we often sing songs before the message is given. You know what that does? That helps us be prepared to hear from God. Because how many of us came in this morning and we weren't quite ready to hear a message? We weren't quite ready to hear what God had for us. In fact, we may have even come just because we know we should come to church. But it's through worship collectively together that we're transformed. If you do these things, Paul says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, we often want to know what God's will is but we're not willing to do these things or we don't do these things. We don't go to him first. We don't surrender. Okay, Lord, I have to make a decision, but Lord, I just surrender it to you. Go into his word. What does God's word say? What do godly men and women have to say about this? What do my brothers and sister in my church have to say to that? Lord, I'm just going to worship you in this situation. And we actually sang that. Even in the tough can't remember the words, but even in the dark times, I'm going to praise the Lord. We, we just sang that. Let's go to, chap, uh, to verse 3. 
For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Well, Paul makes it really clear, right? It's every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, no excuses, all of us. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Paul zeroes in a little bit more in on the context of being a disciple and servant that glorifies God. We can't see ourselves in this way. Why do you think he made this statement? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Do any of us have that problem? Self-examination time. Do I say to myself, I'm doing okay. I can do life on my own. I don't need anyone else. We may not say that publicly, but is that the attitude we have in our heart? Or do we recognize our deep dependence on God and his power? You know, I've had to learn this lesson. Before I go into meetings, a coaching or consulting uh, or mentoring session, I, I pray this. Lord, what gift do you have for me to give to this person from you? I don't want to give it from me. I want it to come from the Lord and that's what I want them to receive. I recognize my need for the Holy Spirit to speak through me and give me the wisdom. And you know what? I can say he provides it every time. Verses come to my mind. Strategies come to my mind. Sometimes before, sometimes as I'm talking to the people. In fact, I had a, a situation um, this past week where I had prayed this. I was meeting with a couple uh, in ministry, and uh, they were working through a problem. The Lord gave me uh, some words, some strategy, and, uh, and I shared it with them. In fact, it came out of my mouth, and I realized, wow, that's, that's really good. And I actually said, you know, I just need to stop here because I need to write this down. I need this for myself. But, you know, when we invite God in, it's amazing how he says, if you invite me in into this situation, I'm there for you. I had to go into some meetings with some very influential people of organizations where the first thing the person said to me is, Steve, I disagree with the decision and the direction. Well, that's a, you know where they stand anyhow. They disagree with you. And uh, uh, beforehand, I've known that that's where they're at. And I prayed and I said, Lord, I can't change them. I can't change their mind. I need you to come. I need you to be there. I need you to show up and speak to them. And it's been amazing. I've sat down and had coffee. We've sat down at the table to have coffee, and they've said that. And then I just listen, and I let them share. And I actually have watched God work in their lives, and they start here where they're totally disagreeing, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk. And finally, they're over here. And then it's like the Lord just taps me on the shoulder and says, okay, you can close it now. And they say, Steve, I'm totally on board with what you're doing. How can I help you? It's amazing. Inviting God to be there and help you. And you know, I can also tell you that this morning, there are people who are praying for us. My prayer partners, I sent out a, an email last, or yesterday asking them to pray for our service today. Um, I'm, I'm not going to come up and speak unless I have people who are praying for us because I truly want God to do a work. The great preacher Spurgeon. Anyone know who Spurgeon was? Okay, a few of the older ones was asked one day why he was so successful in his preaching. And he responded by saying very quickly, my people pray for me. If you want to see Pastor Steve and Pastor Tim be even more successful, then pray for them regularly. Put them on your calendar, on your prayer list. And I know that you, some of you have this. Add it. Pray for them. One way of demonstrating that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought 
is by willing to ask people to pray for us. We all have needs. We all need breakthrough for things. And so going to someone and say, hey, can you pray for me? I'm struggling with this, or I need this help. See, we're a body. We need each other. As a disciple and servant in the kingdom of God, there's absolutely no room for lone rangers. If we don't realize that we need others and others need us, if we're not serving others but only serving ourselves, we're thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. We need each other. We need people to be praying for each of us. Even Jesus did not serve alone. In John 5, 19, it says, Verily, verily, or truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He cannot do only what he sees. He can only do what he, he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. There's that connection there. So, so far, we've seen that we as a disciple, as disciples and servants of the kingdom of God, are to one, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice by pleasing God and bringing glory to him. Number two, not allowing the world to shape us, but rather allow God to transform us by surrendering, reading his word, listening to godly teachers, being in community, and worshiping together. And now we're going to come to verses 4 and 5 that remind us that the disciples and servants of the kingdom of God, we're not only to act, but we are members of one body. It's not even an option for a believer in Jesus Christ not to serve and to serve alone. And it reads, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, how would you feel if today your arm just decided, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to function today. Uh, I don't feel like it. Uh, you know, other parts of my body can, can take up, and, and you know, my right hand, it'll just, ah, it'll just be there. Or maybe your heart says, well, you know, no one actually sees me. I'm just inside, and I'm just going to stop today. I'm just, just going to be chilled and, and quiet and not pump blood today. Yeah, the body, won't, the body won't mind just for a day. And by now, you should be saying, Steve, those are silly scenarios, right? And Paul is saying the same thing. Every part of the body is essential so that we can collectively can bring glory to God. It's not just you bringing glory to God, but the whole body bringing glory to God. And you might give me some pushback here and say, but Steve, I don't have a formal membership with Departure Bay Baptist Church or any church. I don't want you to get confused between membership and being part of the body. I challenge you, though, that if you haven't committed to becoming an official member of a local church of believers, Maybe you need to reconsider why or why not and what God says about it. You know, you can go right back to Romans 12 too. Are you being conformed by the world in some way with an independent spirit of the world? Let's go on to Romans 12 uh, verses 6 to 8. And it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Notice we don't get to choose the gifts. God gives them to us. He knows what he's doing. And remember, we go right back to chapter 11. His thoughts are more greater than our thoughts. We can't uh, give him any advice. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. We're all called to serve, but there is a special gift of serving. If it is teaching, then teach. Teach well. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Anyone not need encouragement? We all need encouragement, don't we? Your leaders need encouragement. You know, these, many of these young leaders that I work with, when I meet with them on a weekly or every two-week basis, one of the things I notice 
is they've been working hard. They, they've got enthusiasm and passion, but they need encouragement. And I remember one saying to me, Steve, uh, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, okay, so has God called you to do this? And he says, yeah, God's called me to do it. And I said, well, let me just tell you two things. First of all, you cannot do it on your own strength. But with God's strength, you can do it. Oh, yeah, I guess I can. I went and did it. And, and it was amazing to see the results. If it is giving, then give generously. Uh, a missionary friend of mine, I was sitting and talking with them, and they said, you know, I'm always struggling with finances. And it's not fair because this other missionary that I have association with, um, they always have lots. I said, okay, tell me more. He said, yeah, I mean, this guy, he constantly on the mission field has multiple vehicles and, and, and funds are coming in. And, and, I, and he said, and he's always giving them away. And, and I said, well, he's got the gift of giving. And if you have the gift of giving... You've got to give it away so God can give you more to give away. And the more that you're giving away, the more he's going to give because you have that gift. Like, you are the conduit for this. And that's true with all of our gifts. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Lead in the strength of the Lord to your best ability. You know, one of the things that I enjoy do is actually helping boards to do this well. To help them walk through. Here's some principles. Here's some things that you need to be aware of. And this is a way that you can be, you can function as a board at a very high level and actually save time. Uh, one of the tools that I, I, I help boards with, um, one board that was meeting constantly for three hours, it actually, they actually got under one hour of meeting just because they want use one tool that helped them to be more diligent. And the last one is, if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, showing mercy is not always that easy. But, but those who have the gift of it, do it cheerfully. And Paul kind of wraps it up in Colossians 3, uh, 23 and 24, where he says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I want to read a story to you by James McGregor Burns. I have no idea who he is, but maybe from the name you might be able to figure it out. And uh, as I read this story, I want you to think about where you might fit into one of these groups and where you want to be. It's called the Irish Priest Out for a Walk. An Irish priest walks along a road where laborers are busy on a cool, foggy morning. The first group of workers were grumbling, and their workplace was disheveled. The priest asked the men what they were doing, and the former replied, Me and the boys are making bricks, fast, Father, fast as we can. Can't really stop to talk. No disrespect. disrespect no disrespect. Got to mix the sand and rock to make bricks. A lot of bricks. The priest bid them good work and continued on his walk. A little ways away, the priest came upon a second group. It looked like the same operation as the first group, but the job site was tidier, and the men seemed more content and moved with a deeper sense of purpose than the first group. Again, the priest greeted them and again asked what they were doing. The foreman smiled and said, Father, we're helping to make walls. Right now, we're mixing sand and water and rocks to make the bricks for the crew up there on the north end side of the building. The priest blessed their work and continued down the road. As he walked, he began to hear joyous singing and laughing. As he rounded the bend, he came upon a third group of laborers. It looked like the same operation that the other two groups were doing, but the sight was immaculate. The bricks were stacked squarely. The men worked in a collective rhythm. As the priest arrived, the men stopped and greeted him warmly. Good morning, men, the priest said. And what would you be doing today? 
Ah, Father, today is a true blessing from the Lord. Today we are building a house of God. When we're done, our village will come and worship here for generations. Right now we're helping to make the walls. Our part of that is to mix the rocks and sand and water to make bricks. And true labor of love it is. The first crew saw themselves as just brick makers. The second team saw their brick making work as an integral part of making a wall, that greater context, creating more meaningful perspective that results in their desire to make quality products. The third group was clearly enrolled in a ennobling vision and saw the work as integral to something wonderful. This ennoblement caused them to work and produce at the highest level. They were worshiping the Lord through building bricks. So which crew, work crew, best describes me? You. Which group was being transformed? I know which group I want to be in. I want the Holy Spirit to work in me. I want to be transformed. And you know, it's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing, daily thing, daily situation. You know, how do I see problems? Are they problems or are they opportunities for God to do something great? And it's not easy. I'm not saying that going through these things are easy. But do I allow God to make this into an opportunity for him to be glorified. We're going to be taking uh, part in the Lord's Supper now, and if the, the men who are serving, if you'd come forward, that would be great. We have... Uh, we talked at the very beginning of how great our God is, how powerful, all-knowing, majestic. There's none of us who can give God advice, even though sometimes we might try. The Lord Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross and rose again for me, for each one of you. And he's called us to obey and he said remember me by these the bread and the cup remember me Luke 22 reads then they came the, then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the passover lamb had to be sacrificed Jesus sent Peter and John saying go and make preparation for us to eat the passover where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparation there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. And I'm going to just ask you now, just to stop and prepare yourselves. Maybe there's been something that God has been saying to you this morning. I just want us all to bow our heads and talk to him privately. Prepare yourself. Let's pray. I'm going to finish up this morning by prayerfully reading Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing to do his will. And may he accomplish it in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever 
and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you today.